Okay, the good news is this is the shortest presentation, and we will finish early. Okay? <laughs> um, the bad news is this is the most boring one so far. Just kidding. It is kind of boring. Though. We won't cover my background again. So what we are going to cover, um, it's a bit of uh, a shift. Uh, we're going to go back and talk about infrastructure and infrastructure monitoring. This is a little bit of a deep dive on the model for infrastructure, so the host model. We did a little bit of it in the last talk that I did. We're going to do a little bit more here. And then we're going to talk about how we extend that model for virtual infrastructure and for cloud. Um, I'm going to take all of the time up until uh, the bell rings, and then I'm going to try to finish in the time between the bell rings to see if we can wrap up with a whole period to spare. I think I'll be able to do that. So what is infrastructure? We've already talked about this quite a bit. It's the machinery that the applications run on. And as we know, that can be physical machinery or it can be logical or abstract machinery in the case of virtualization. Um, and the machinery is you know, understood to be, it's a computer. Um, and the language that we use in Dell is host. We use the word host to mean a computer. Um, network and storage are both considered part of infrastructure, but from an application performance monitoring perspective, the host is the most interesting piece. It is the thing that provides the resources. It's sort of like a, a window through which we see infrastructure. So if you're running, remember I used that example before, you're running JBoss, so you're running a Java virtual machine, you have an application that's running on it, and as you're running that application, you know you're running on a computer, and you know that it's a host, and you know that you are given CPU on which to execute, and you know that you're given a certain amount of memory, and you know that you have access to a network, and you have a certain amount of bandwidth, and you know that you have disk space and disk drives that are available to you. So host, to a large degree, is not really a machine. It's a logical abstraction that we use inside of APM to represent the resources that we need. Now, it didn't start out that way. It started out as a host was a physical machine, but because of the modeling capabilities, we were able to reuse the host model and extend it. So just a bit of history, most of which maybe you weren't even alive for. So um, in, the, in the beginning, like years and years ago, Computers, that, I think there was a guy at IBM who once said there's a worldwide market for five computers. Um, back then, computers were the size of this room or bigger, and they took teams to continue to run. Now you have computers in your pocket. You might wear a computer on your wrist. Um, computers are much smaller. In, say, the 80s, we started to see cheaper computers. We started to see desktops and small machines that were able to do real things. Um, and most companies started to run, uh, buy their own computers at that time and run their own applications. But everything was run inside the company. So if you worked at one company, you used their computers, and then you would go to another company, and you would use their completely disconnected computers. There was no internet. So in the 90s, the computers got cheaper, but then they all got connected as well. So the internet came along, even though the internet existed since the 70s, um, the, the social internet uh, came into being in the 90s. Everybody hooked their computers up to the internet, and you started to see public-facing applications. So you would have a company that would put up a website, and the website would have services that the company might charge for. In the 90s was when you started to get into public hosting as well, because some companies wanted to do things on the internet and make money, but they didn't want to run the computers because they weren't good at it. So they would get someone else to run the computers and their software would run on it. And this is where cloud started to come from. You know, we just, t someone else wanted to run the computers and control the electricity and do all of the things you have to do to keep a computer running. That was hosting. Now we call it cloud. Although it is different technically, that's where it came from. And then of course, in the early 21st century, which I guess is this one, um, we had this, this virtualization trend in the last 10 years where now most workloads are run on virtual machines and everything is very abstract. Can I get a water? Thank you. 
All right. So how do we model the infrastructure? So I can't do this with one hand. Hold on. It's OK. Oh, thank you. I'm not strong enough to open my own water. OK. So infrastructure monitoring is really the first kind of monitoring that existed. We wanted to know if the computer was still running or not and how the resources are being used. In fact, those old centralized computers from the 60s and 70s, um, you were parceled out a certain amount of time executing on the computer to do your job and a certain amount of resources. So that's where the notions came from. We just accept these notions as, as normal, but that's where they, they began. Um, but if for infrastructure monitoring, we wanted to know, is the machine running? How are the resources being used? And are there any system problems? A system problem would be a network card has failed. Or like Joe said, someone kicked out the network connection. Or the CPU is running too hot and is about to fail. Those are hardware failures. Hardware failures used to be very frequent, and they're a lot less frequent now. Or in some cases, we don't care about them because we, we, uh, we just run another machine. So infrastructure monitoring is really the base level of all monitoring. It's very important for application performance monitoring. And like I said, we, we started the model-based approach to handle this, but we have managed to evolve through a whole bunch of changes in infrastructure. So this is the host model. So finally, a picture. It's nice. It's not really a nice picture, but that's OK. So um, this is the host model in Foglight. Uh, at the top, you see the host object. A host contains memory, obviously. A host contains a, an object called host CPUs, which then contains one or more processors. Okay, so there's one of these and many of these. A host contains a host storage object, which then contains multiple logical disk and physical disk instances. There's also a host network object representing network and one or more network interfaces, pretty much always more than one. Um, and then there is a single host or an operating system object, and it is run, It has multiple host process objects and host service objects. We're going to go through each one of these individually, but <clears throat> I just wanted you to note the pattern here where if we have multiple resources, we have a summary object. So the job of the host CPU's object is to summarize the data in the processor objects. And the reason for that is if I want the CPU utilization for the computer, I want a summarized one. And then I want the individual ones for all eight of my processors. OK, that's a common pattern we're using in this model. Does it make sense to everybody? Can anyone tell me where we're not using that pattern? Which object does not use that summary object pattern? It's memory, because it does not have a child object, right? Memory does not have, you don't have a memory and then you have multiple memories. Although that did used to be a, an architecture, we just don't do that architecture anymore. Um, not in 40 years. So the host object, it's identified by the name property and it is the, we call it the FQDN, fully qualified domain name of the object. So my my host uh, or my laptop has a fully qualified domain name of uh, torjeff.prod.quest.corp. That is all I need to do to identify this machine. Um, we do capture the IP addresses. We have a primary and a list of IP addresses. But as noted before, we can't use that as the identity for a host because the IP address could change, right? especially for a laptop. Um, but DHCP, you know, the IP address might change. Other metrics that are on the host include the number of processes that are running, the run queue length, number of interrupts and context switches, both calculated or both uh, measured as rates, um, and the available paging space. So these are standard host summary metrics that we collect. So every host, we, we get this information. By the way, one thing I should mention, the reason a host isn't a single object with a whole bunch of metrics in it um, is so that we can minimize the space that's used. If we had all of the properties and metrics in one object, 
we would be wasting space for every single host. Second thing I wanted to mention, if you have that use case again with JBoss, and I, I'm not doing any infrastructure monitoring, I'm monitoring JBoss, all I will create is the top level host object with the name, and I'll have none of the metric values filled in. Okay, so it is a model that allows for partial completion. We don't have to have all of these things filled in. You can create your own agent in Foglight that creates a host object and nothing else. And it fills in all of the metrics. It can fill in the number of processes, as it can fill in the run queue length, but it does not create any of those other objects. We can do that too. So it's a very flexible model. It does not all have to exist every time. Memory is pretty simple. There's a single memory object. It, it exists every time, pretty much. Um, there's a capacity and a consumed uh, metric in megabytes, so that's how much memory am I using, how much is available. Um, and they're both captured as metrics because the avail even the uh, you know, total capacity can change often enough that we didn't want to make it a property. Uh, also, we quite often want to graph that value. So you want to see a graph that has, you know, the amount of the memory that's available and then the amount that you consume so that you can see it. Um, utilization is um, uh, calculated, it's, but it is a metric on the object. We don't usually collect that value. Um, and then we've got paging rates for memory. So how much um, uh, memory are we uh, paging in and out? And those are measured in, um, in rates per second. Rates per second. The host CPU's object, again, it's a single instance attached to a host, contains one or more processor objects, depends on the number of processors. Um, and then we have, in this object, we have summary metrics. So the percent user time, system time, and idle time, and utilization for all of the processors on this CPU. We also measure used and total hertz. Why do we do that? Can anyone tell me why we measure both utilization and the hertz? Nobody. Joe, do you know why? Because the, uh, the usage, the utilization percentage uh, is various as an actual resource based on the hertz use. Right, so the utilization is not a reliable metric for a virtual system. So if I'm using 80% of my CPU, that's interesting, but um, if I'm on a virtual system, I can simply reassign the amount of CPU that that machine gets. I can model four CPUs as one. I can assign how many uh, megahertz are available for that virtual machine. So the percentage becomes uninteresting, we also, so we also measure the actual uh, CPU consumed. So that's an example of where we use the metrics to account for the virtual model. So for each processor on a CPU, we have a processor object, and then we collect the same metrics. So the same metric set is collected for every single processor, and then we have summary metrics as well. There are APIs that will give us only the summarized values and other APIs that will give us per processor values. Sometimes we calculate the summarized values in host CPUs and sometimes we collect them. So host storage is the same kind of that, that pattern again. It's a summary object. It contains lists of logical and physical disks and we measure the disk utilization, reads and writes, um, and the volume of uh, data that's read and written, transfer rate, how much space is used and available. So all the stuff you'd want to know about disks. <clears throat> These, this is, of course, from the host perspective. When we do storage monitoring, we get much more detailed information about storage arrays and how they're related and you know, other metrics that are related to the performance. So the physical and logical disk objects, as you can imagine, are very similar. They have the same kinds of metrics. Some of them are a little bit different, but it's mostly the same. And you get one instance for, per physical and logical disk. So physical disk is for actual physically installed disk, and logical is for partitions or file systems, NFS-mounted file systems, uh, that, that kind of thing, shared files. And so we, we create the right object depending on what we detect in the system. So the network is a similar kind of thing. 
We have a utilization metric, um, number of packets sent and received, and send and receive rates. So the basic metric, metrics for network utilization of a host. And then we collect all that same information for every single network interface. So if you do IP config on your laptop, you're going to see that you probably have three or four network interfaces or more. Um, and so we calculate or we uh, collect all this information um, plus some extra stuff. So we've got uh, some packet dropped information per network interface. We've got some additional properties as well. So we get the IP address per network interface, MAC address, port number, and a few other details about the kind of network that that interface is working with. So very detailed, the host model is very detailed. On the operating system side, we have one summary object for the operating system, and it will have the type of operating system, which is right now one of Windows, Linux, AIX, HPUX, or Sun. And then we have more detailed information. So the name, um, the architecture, so it might be x86, um, the, the version, service pack, version numbers, build numbers. So all the things that you see when you look at an operating system, all the things that make up the detail about what that is. And we just store that in an object as properties. Um, then inside of, or, or as children of the operating system object, we will have a list of host processes. These represent each process. So these are, these are observations, right? We don't actually do these as objects. So it's a good time to talk about observations. So here's, here's something to think about. What is the unique identity We'll listen to the music for a minute. Are there words to this song that you can sing? La, la, la. No? OK. <laughs> Does it go one more time? Or is that it? That's it? OK. No. <laughs> Okay, so this is a, a mandatory question. I need an answer from the class. What would the identity be for a process that is running on a computer? A process. What would be the identity? And don't be shy because all the answers are wrong. So just tell me what you think the identity for a process would be and I'll tell you why it wouldn't work. Someone has to answer. Yes, go ahead. Uh, there is the flat number in its uh, process. Yes, a process uh, ID. But uh, the process ID, but it is not enough because uh, if you need to put it in the full model, you need to add, add the uh, operating system host name. Well, if, if the process is attached to the host, it'll be OK because it's in the context of that host. It'll only, so for example, I have a process on here called PowerPoint. Um, it'll have a process ID, say the process ID is five. Um, that is the only process ID five that's running on this host. So, well, no, the, the host isn't, well, yeah, it, yeah, you're right. The host would have to be part of the identity in a system, you're right. The host, yeah. It would have to have a reference back up to the host. So the reason the process ID won't work as identity is what if I'm running, um, say, Apache, which is a web server, uh, and I want to track its performance over time, and I have a process called Apache, and it has a process ID of 10, and then it crashes and I run it again. I don't get the same process ID. It is a different instance of Apache. It's a different process. But from a usability perspective, I want to be able to know that that Apache is my Apache that I'm running on the system. Similarly, you can't use the name of the process either. So I couldn't use Apache.exe or Apache, whatever, whatever operating system I'm running on, um, because I might be running two instances of it. So what we do instead is instead of creating an object for every single process, we, <coughs> we actually capture them in a kind of like a database table form. So we will capture the process ID, 
the process name, and a series of metrics as a single unit, and then store it in a table. We call this an observation. And it's an alternate form of representing the data for this kind of data. It's for data that doesn't have a clear identity. Data that has metrics, but not necessarily an identity. We store it this way so that we can extract things from it later. So I would be able to um, store these, and then I would be able to see for a particular moment in time how much CPU was being consumed by all the Apache processes running on my computer, or how many Apache processes were running. I still need to store that, but I don't want to consume all these model objects because I would be constantly creating and destroying them because there's no clear identity. Okay. There's also a host service that I, I won't go into too much. Okay, so I just want to back up. I know it looks like we're not making progress because I keep going backwards, right? But back to here. Why do we create all of this? The reason we create all of this is that if I want to create a user interface that shows metrics and properties of a host, this is my data structure, always. Some of the metrics might not be there, but this data structure is the same for hosts. So I want to write a dashboard that summarizes host performance. I can rely on this model. It always, it's always the same if it's fully instantiated. So the end result is that I can create dashboards like this. So this is a summary of a summary dashboard of all of the Windows dashboards that are, that are all of the Windows hosts that are running in a system. I'm able to list them down the left hand side and then I can show um, CPU, network, memory, and disk utilization for those hosts. And I can show that no matter what version of the operating system. And I can also show that for all of the different kinds of hosts. So I could do it for Linux as well, or I could do it for, for any kind of Unix, SunOS or HPUX or AIX. So this dashboard always works the same. And that's a huge benefit for us because we know that the structure of the data is consistent, so we don't have to change this dashboard. In fact, we haven't had to change this dashboard. This is another example. So when I'm looking at an individual host, I always have a CPU summary. Remember, it's CPU, that host CPU's object, it had CPU utilization, and it had run queue length, and I'm able to graph those. Same thing for memory. I have my percentage utilization for memory. I have my storage metrics, and I also have network metrics. You'll notice also, because of the model structure, I have alarm summaries for each. So remember, when we build these models, we put alarms inside of them, and then we're able to uh, note whether or not a host al has an alarm or whether a CPUs have an alarm. So maybe I have a problem, in this case I have a problem with my storage, but I don't have a problem with my CPU. And I do have a problem with memory, but I don't have a problem with network. It helps you diagnose issues. So having the model and having the rules running in a particular part of that model allows us to diagnose problems more quickly. Okay? <coughs> this is another dashboard, and this dashboard is actually about five years old in Foglight. It's fairly ugly. We don't like it, but we haven't had time to fix it. Um, but it has a lot of the metrics that we talked about. It's got that network utilization. It shows um, multiple interfaces, although it doesn't look like we're gathering that. Oh, no, it says we have 14 network interfaces on this, on this one. Um, we have CPU utilization. We have the number of processors. We have the processor queue length, 137 processes, 22 in the uh, processor queue. We have the memory utilization. We have the disk read and write values are there. We have logical and physical disks. So you can see that that model is manifested in this dashboard. So it's real, I'm not lying. Unless I made this picture up. So that's great. What about virtual infrastructure? So how does virtual infrastructure differ? So just to review this, in VMware, and it's a good example to talk about, how many people here have used VMware? 
Okay, a few. Uh, Hyper-V? Probably not so much. Microsoft needs to make some donations to the university. <laughs> okay, so um, a physical host that's called an ESX server runs a layer of software called a hypervisor. This hypervisor allows you to create abstract hosts. And they are called virtual machines. A virtual machine is just like a computer. It has an operating system on it, but it's not real. It's running on the hypervisor and being asked to use only part of the resources available on that ESX server. Why do we do this? We do this so that we can control the resources that are used. So in the old days, you might have an application that does some kind of nightly processing. And it, you know, it runs a script and it, it uses a certain amount of CPU. Now we would have, you know, in the 80s or 90s, we would have assigned a machine to that and left it running in a dark room. Now, that machine might consume 200 watts of electricity it might use only 5% of its CPU. That's a shame, that's a waste of resources. So what we do, or what we have been doing the last five years, is we take that physical machine, we do a conversion on it, we convert it from physical to virtual, we then run it on a hypervisor, and we give it resources, but we don't give it a whole CPU, we give it a fraction of a CPU, and we give it a tiny bit of shared memory. And now that thing is no longer consuming 200 watts of electricity, it's probably consuming more like 15 watts. So we save memory. We also don't have to store that machine anymore. We don't need physical space, so it has no footprint. Okay, that's why we do the virtualization. It's all stored and available um, from a piece of software called the Virtual Center. Uh, so that's interesting. We can ask the virtual center for all of this data. We can make a series of API calls and we get everything. We get everything about how it's set up and we get all of the OS monitoring for the ESX server and we get all of the monitoring for the individual virtual machines all in one set of API calls, all from one place, which is great. What it means from a modeling perspective is we have a new relationship we need to understand. There is a relationship between the virtual machine and the actual machine that it's running on. That's the first thing. The second thing is traditional metrics might be meaningless. Like we talked about earlier, CPU utilization doesn't mean anything for that box that I brought. So someone might look at, you know, that box that was running that batch job that was only using 5% of the CPU. Well, some smart guy might look at it when we're running in virtualization and say, what did you do to that thing? It used to run only 5% of the CPU, now it uses 75%. Well, the reason is, is that maybe we used to give it a, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe we used to give it, uh, you know, 2 gigahertz, and now we're only giving it 150 megahertz, right? So what's important is actually how much consumed you've, you've got. And there are other changes to metrics in the model. So model-based monitoring is helpful uh, for us for virtualization because it allows us to, to model those relationships and it also allows us to layer in the new metrics. So creating this new model, you might think that what you want to do is create a subtype. So a virtual machine is going to be a subtype of, of host, it's going to extend host, and same with ESX server. The problem with that is that when we're doing application performance monitoring, we don't always know, in fact, we rarely know everything when we do a collection. So again, that JBoss example, I am collecting from JBoss, I know I'm running on torjeff.prod.quest.corp, my machine, I know I'm running there, but I don't know if it's a physical machine or a virtual machine until I try to deploy monitoring. So I can't change the type easily. So instead what we do is we add instances of a special type to mark up that instance. So I create the host, and then if I find out later that it's a virtual machine, I add a special class to that host that marks it as a virtual machine. So you can see these, and I don't know, I can't really read this, not even from here. I can't imagine you guys can read this at all. So I'll just describe what's there. There is a details collection in every single host object, and it will contain host extension uh, uh, objects. A host extension is a special type um, that you extend. 
And if, if a host has a VMW virtual machine instance in its details collection, then we know it's a virtual machine and we will look for additional information about that virtual machine, like the ESX server that it's running on, like the data center that it's part of. And we'll also collect different extra special metrics. So this is what virtual monitoring looks like when we get to that part. So when we are doing VMware monitoring, we're actually able to find virtual centers, data centers, ESX hosts, resource pools, and virtual machines. When you click on one of those virtual machines, so this is infrastructure monitoring for the VMware administrator, okay? And they want to know, how is my VMware environment running? This is their perspective. When you get to eventually click on one of those virtual machines, you may find a host that looks familiar to an application performance monitoring person. You may find that host, Tor Jeff, that's running as one of those virtual machines. So it depends how you come at the data. Um, that, that determines what user interface you get. But this user interface shows that we are able to model all of the virtual relationships inside of Foglight. So again, a virtual center has data centers, a data center has ESX hoax, hosts in it. Um, one thing that's really important to note, and this causes us a lot of, or has caused us problems in the field, virtual machines can be moved from host to host. So I might look at um, the workload that's running on a certain machine and say, you know what, I'm going to put this on this other host because I want to have space on this ESX host for some mission critical application. So you'll see a vMotion event, which basically means this virtual machine is now moving somewhere else, and it run, starts running somewhere else. So when you're, this is very important, when you're running a virtual machine, you cannot rely on it running on a particular physical host. That's the nature of virtualization. Even if you can find out that it was running on a particular host at a point in time, it could change. And that's not under your control if you're an application performance uh, monitoring person. But we're able to model all these relationships and track the changes because the changes may become important. Maybe you're looking at some of Joe's metrics, you notice the request response time gets very slow all of a sudden. You can correlate that with a vMotion event, then you can go back to the virtual administrator and say, hey, ever since you moved my machine over to that server, my performance is terrible. You need to move it back. That's why we collect these things. We don't do it just for fun. So for the cloud, things get more interesting in one way and less interesting in another. And the, the way in which they get less interesting, it's not just because it's late, um, there's less for us to know. So at least with VMware and Hyper-V, we know about the physical machines. For cloud, you don't know these things at all. You just order up a certain amount of resources and the rest is completely hidden from you. You don't really know anything. You certainly don't know what host you're running on. You might know the data center that it's in, or at least the time zone, or, or you know, it, you might not know physically where it is at all. You just might know it's in the Midwest of the United States, or it's in China. That's all you might know. So the purpose of an infrastructure cloud is elastic access to infrastructure. So you can create these machines on demand and what you basically do is choose how much you want to pay for what you want to get back out. There are similar abstractions to VMware, but we have, like it says here, no access to the physical layer. We do not know what host you're running on. You just pay for it. So a lot of the things that we're able to collect for VMware and, and Hyper-V come out of the model, and they're replaced with details about how we pay. So we'll know what kind of template we've chosen and how much it costs and whether we've been billed or not. So, can we accommodate this in the host model? We can, and we've proven it already. So we're still able to take that JBoss instance and we know it's running on a host, and then if we find out later that that host is actually on Amazon and it's an EC2 instance, we can create a model of, of an articulated model for that as well. So again, we extended the host model. So we have a host extension object called EC2 instance, okay? And it has an identity. And so every time we create a host object, if we find out it's running on Amazon, we mark it up, and there we go. And we have model elements that represent the different things in Amazon. But unlike in Virtual Center, where we model the things we can discover through the, the VMware APIs, 
we have to model the things that Amazon will tell us about, which are more about what we pay for, what's, what's metered, in other words. So we're almost done. just want to summarize what we've learned. So there's a host model. It can handle physical infrastructure. We can extend it to handle virtual infrastructure. And we are still extending it for cloud-based infrastructure as well. And that's it. So are there any questions? I didn't think there would be. So we're very sorry that these sessions went so late at night. I know it's hard for everyone to stay awake. Um, but we would like to thank you for coming. Um, it's been very nice to talk to you. And we hope to see you again sometime. Do you have uh, any wrap-up words, Yingwa? No. Yingwa also says thank you. <laughs> thank you.